Hi everyone and welcome back. For this video, we're gonna be talking about chapter 15, which looks at sampling. So when we're looking at a topic or subject, we have to start with this larger population. And that really refers to the entire group of people you are interested in learning more about. So that could be veterans with PTSD. That could be moms who had a baby before 18. It could be individuals who are affected by natural disasters, right? We have these like larger groups of people that we want to study. But obviously, we're not going to be able to easily do that. There are a few examples. The idea of a census is where we study an entire population. But one thing we've talked about over the last several years, especially with COVID falling right in that time when they were supposed to do the census, is it's really hard to count an entire population, especially in a country like America. We're very rural and urban and suburban, and we're very spread out, and there's a whole lot of people here. And so a census isn't always going to be an option for us. If we want to study veterans who have experienced PTSD, it would be really difficult to study the entire population. So instead, what we do is we often look at a sample, which is a portion of the population chosen to be in a research study and then we'll talk a little bit about how we get to that point but this idea of starting with the larger issue or the larger population and then kind of narrowing it down to the sample of people that we believe might be representative of the larger population is called the process of sampling so sampling procedures vary depending on the study design and availability of clients to recruit so depending on a quantitative versus a qualitative study depending if we're going to hand out surveys or if we're going to interview people face to face and just how much do we have access to the individuals we want to study all of those things come together when we're thinking about the sampling process so ideally we want samples that include unbiased sample procedures and we'll talk a little bit about that and a sample that's large enough to be representative. If I have a population of, let's say, college students, millions of college students across the country, and that's my population, and I get a sample of three college students, do I feel like that's really gonna be large enough to illustrate or help me understand the concept in relationship to all college students? Probably not. So there's definitely an art to this. And one thing the book talks about, and I love Ruben and Babby that they mentioned this, it's the idea that if you have biased procedures and have a huge sample, a huge number of people, it might still be unrepresentative of the population. And that's one of the challenges that we'll talk about with non-probability sampling, is that you can have hundreds and hundreds of people, but a lot of times those are biased procedures, and so they may not really represent the population as a whole. Or you can have unbiased procedures. We're gonna talk a little bit about probability sampling at the end, and it can be representative of the population. That's why we can do things like large-scale political surveys and have a pretty good idea of how the country feels, often only based off one to two thousand people so we're going to talk a little bit about this and how do we do this how do we increase that external validity that we mentioned last time right is it representative of the larger population and how do we select people in a way that minimizes that bias so there's two categories of sampling procedures one is called probability sampling and it's the idea of random selection and that each participant has the same likelihood or probability they will be selected they often use the example of flipping a coin over and over and over the odd that you'll get heads or tails is even. There's not one side that's weighted. They both have a likely chance of coming up. And so I have a really good video that I've attached to the module that shows the difference between probability and non-probability sampling from the Pew Research Organization, and it's really good. But it really talks about this idea of random selection and the idea that anybody has the same likelihood of getting selected or the same probability. Then you have the idea of non-probability sampling, and this is often more common in social work research, and it's not dependent on random selection. And so we'll talk about that and the different ways that we can select people for a sample in a non-probability sampling procedure, but it still has a specific process. So even though it may not have random selection and follow a probability sampling criteria, it still has a specific process. So we'll talk about that as well. Okay, so when we think about the sampling process, I love this, this graphic. So again, we start with this larger population. We have to think about, are we going big, big, like every American? Are we looking at every person in a state? every university student ever? Am I looking at the students at my university only? Am I looking at students in social work majors across the country or just social work majors at my university? So we have to figure out what that larger population is. Ideally, we'll then be able to get a sampling frame. And we'll talk about 
that more, but it's the idea, it's the list from which we draw our sample. And so it's kind of viewed as this intermediate point between the overall population and the sample that we draw. We say, here's the overall population. Maybe I'm not able to get the name of every single individual in this population, but I do have a group, a large group. Let's say I can get names of social workers that are registered as part of the National Association of Social Workers. The sampling frame would be the list of all of the participants or all the social workers that are currently members. Now, one of the challenges that we'll discuss is sampling frames aren't always complete. For example, lots of social workers are not part of the NASW. So you might say, hey, I want to study all social workers in America and use the sampling frame from the NASW. You're still not going to get everybody because not every single social worker is listed. But the sampling frame at least gives us a good place to start. Then we start to think about recruitment. How are we going to recruit our population? Exclusion and inclusion criteria. Do we only want to look at one gender of individuals, one profession, one major of students? How do we decide who's going to be in the sample and who's not? And at the end, we come up with our sample size. So a lot of times you'll see that maybe the sampling frame has 10,000 people on it, but we only end up with a sample of 800. And depending on the sampling process, that can still be pretty representative of the population. So we really want to think about who is our population? Is there a master list of some way we can get names? What would be the recruitment, exclusion, and inclusion criteria? And what is the sample? So here's an example of an article from McCarthy. And what McCarthy was looking at was the relationship between burnout and perceptions and experiences of interprofessional collaboration. Well, they had a sampling frame, which was a list of field instructors at a large mid-Atlantic state MSW degree program. So they weren't able to necessarily survey every single field instructor across the United States, but they were able to go to a large MSW degree program. They had this master list or sampling frame of field instructors that was 623 people. They came up with some inclusion criteria. Participants had to have an MSW and be over the age of 18. And then they sent out surveys. Then participants responded and they were able to get a percentage of that. So hopefully that helps. The population is social workers or field instructors. The sampling frame was this list of field instructors for this MSW program. Then they came up with inclusion criteria. They had to have an MSW and be over the age of 18. Then they were able to use their sampling procedures and come up with their final sample. So we'll talk first about non-probability sampling. A lot of times I find this is one is a little bit easier to grasp. So it's very common in social work, and we'll talk about why, depending on some of the non-probability sampling techniques. It's really helpful because a lot of times, remember I talked about we have this sampling frame. We don't often have a sampling frame for very vulnerable or marginalized individuals. There may not be a large sampling frame or master list of people who are undocumented in an area. There may not be a master list of the number of people who are unhoused in a community or those who have been abused or those who are in relationships experiencing domestic violence. So a lot of times when we're looking at probability sampling, we have to have some sort of sampling frame. And unfortunately, because in social work for the safety of our clients or just by the nature of who they are in the systems they're in, we may not have one. And so non-probability sampling ends up becoming really common in social work for that reason. So there are four types, availability sampling, sometimes called convenient sampling, proposive or judgmental sampling, quota sampling, or snowball sampling. So let's look at each. So availability sampling is sometimes called accidental or convenient sampling. This is where we use participants that are easily available. And so what you do is you stand on the street corner and literally as people walk by, you interview them. Hey, do you have a few minutes? I'd love to hear your thoughts on this new bill. There are participants that are easily available, but it's not very random. It's the people that happen to be walking by near street corner. And so this can create some biased procedure. If you're out there at one o'clock on a Thursday, maybe you're only interviewing people who are working in that part of the community, but not people who live in the community outside of that city block or people whose kids are in school. And so you might get a biased sample, but a lot of times we use this. This might be things like college students in a college classroom. You use participants, they're there, they're at the university, they're willing to take a survey availability sampling. Again, one of the complaints is that a lot of our research is done typically on undergraduate students, but they may not be representative of the larger population. So there's some pros and cons for availability sampling. It is less expensive. A lot of times it may be easier to access. A lot of times if you want, let's say a sampling frame and you want a list of all of the registered nurses in a community or registered social workers, a lot of times you have to pay to get access to that list. And so it can be really expensive. Availability sampling is a hey, I don't have to try to comb through and figure out who I'm going to interview. I got the people right here, right now. 
but there's a lot of cons. Like I said, it can be a bias sample depending on who you interview and how you interview them. And it's got limited generalizability. If you are on a street corner and you only interview a few people walking by at that moment, can you really say that's representative of the whole community and how they feel about something? The second type is purposive or judgmental sampling. And so this is where you work with an expert in the community of somehow or outside of the community to identify participants or leaders who might be representative of the population. So this might be a year working, you want to do a survey of people who are recently unhoused. And so you go to the local homeless shelter and you work with the director there. And the director says, look, I've got a couple of really awesome individuals here. They're recently unhoused. Uh, they understand the complexities of it. I think they'd be really good people to interview. They give you a lot of good information. And so we're looking for someone who represents our population, or sometimes we look for an atypical case. Let's say if we have a natural disaster, 95% of people respond one way, 5% respond a different way. We might wanna look at that 5% and do a study related to them. Why are they so different than 95% of the other people? And so sometimes we also call this deviant case sampling, which is where we look at the extremes. People are on either end of an issue or are very different than the population. This is really common, especially in qualitative research, which we'll talk about in the next few chapters. The third type is quota sampling. And I love, this is a study by Furtree et al. And I think it shows really well how they got to that point. And so quota sampling is the idea that we start with a set of the target population's characteristics. We create this matrix with proportions maybe of demographic issues, like this number of people who are identified as this gender, this number of people in a socioeconomic economic status. Then we collect participants to match the existing quota that we have. And we hope it's more representative, even though it's not random selection. So let's look at this. This study, they wanted to look, the population was households in Java and Sumatra Islands, so 54 million people. They were not going to be able to survey all of those people easily. So they wanted to come up with a sample of 1,500 households. So in order to make sure that those 1,500 represented the 54 million people in that area, they they came up with some household criteria. They had to be from ordinary households consisting of one family. One of the family members had to be an active worker and have a monthly income. Then they looked at the proportion by province and the number of people that were rural versus urban households and then formal versus informal sectors. So then what they did is they selected individuals that matched the proportion of provinces. They said, look, if 80% of our community is rural, we're gonna make sure that 80% of the people that we select are from rural households. If 50% identify as male, then we're going to make sure that approximately 50% of our individuals are male, 50% identify as female. And so you really look at the proportion based on some of the variables we're looking at. If, so then we figure out our proportion based on the population as a whole, and we want to make sure that our sample kind of matches it. Now, this isn't random selection. We are purposely saying, okay, these households match these criteria, but it's still a good way to make sure that our sample represents the population a little bit more than maybe the other types of sampling. And finally, the last one is snowball sampling. And this is really great when you're studying a population of individuals that is difficult to access. So those who are undocumented, those who are unhoused, people who have recently immigrated to the country. And so they may not feel comfortable speaking to you. And so with snowball sampling, you start with someone, and then you say, hey, do you know anybody else in your community who might be willing to participate in this study? They go out, they recruit people, and then you say, hey, do you know anybody else? Do you know anybody else? And you keep growing your sample based on that word of mouth. This is really good for exploratory studies, especially when it's a new topic and we don't really know, to be able to say like, hey, this seems like it's a sensitive issue or it's a new issue, who do you think would be willing to talk to me as well? So snowball sampling can be really helpful for certain situations. So those are the four types of non-probability sampling that Ruben and Babby address. Now we're gonna look at probability sampling. Now this depends on random selection, like we talked about the likelihood that everyone has an equal chance or probability of being chosen. This is when we emphasize a group of elements and we use a sampling frame, like I mentioned, a list of those elements. And I say elements because it could be individuals, it could be schools. You could say, look, I've got 50 schools in the area. I have the sampling frame that lists every single school. Then you're gonna start to narrow it down by using different types of probability sampling procedures. It may not always represent the larger population, especially with high rates of non-response bias, which we'll talk about, and it's still only generally realizable to the sampling frame. If I have 50 schools in my frame and I study, let's say 14 of them, I can maybe say the representative of the 50 schools in the sampling frame, but could I really say the representative of schools in a state two states over? Probably not. But it still gets 
more external validity than maybe some of the other techniques we've talked about. The book also talks about sampling error and kind of the risk of that. And what that is, it's the difference between the mean values of the sample and the mean values of the entire population. And so it's understanding that we might get one mean score, one set of data from a sample, but if we're not careful and we don't have a large enough sample, that may not match the mean value of the larger population. So for example, I might say, look, I did a study and I surveyed 20 people randomly and the mean income was $20,000. But if there was any sort of bias in there or my sample was too small, I could find out later that, man, the mean was not 20,000, it was 70,000. And so the difference between the mean value of my larger population and my sample was pretty skewed. It had high sampling error. Now, having a larger sample can reduce this and increase our confidence that the error is small enough that we're close. Sometimes you'll see articles that will say things like, we believe that it's 43% plus or minus two points. So they say that it could either be 41%, 45%, somewhere in that range. But if you had someone that said, well, I think it's 50% plus or minus 50 points, that means it could range from 0% to 100%, meaning tons of sampling error. So let's talk about the different probability sampling types. So the first one they talk about is simple random sampling. You use sampling frame, you assign a number to every single element, then you use a random number generator, you can use those online, to select your sample. The challenge is this can be really laborious if you have a large sample. If I have 20,000 people in my sampling frame and I have to do a number 1 through 20,000 in my system and then try to randomly select and see which person was which, that can be really challenging. Often people talk about the use of systematic sampling, which is in that same vein. But what you do is you take your sampling frame or your list and you say we're going to use every case element. So if you have 10,000 elements, you might say I'm going to sample every 10th element. That would leave me with a sample of 1,000 elements. So thinking about, let's say I have a list, you don't start at one, we might start at 43. And if we say we want to do every 10th element, then the people at number 43, 53, 63, 73, 83, all the way down are going to be sampled. So it's a good way to make sure that you're sampling people people kind of spread apart, but that it's still random. It's not saying I'm only going to do the first 20 people that submitted the survey because that could be a biased sample. It's saying we have this huge sampling frame. We're going to pick every 10th element. There's also something called stratified sampling, which increases the degree of representativeness and decreases sampling error. So this can be really laborious also if you have a large sample, but what you do is you're gonna to put together stratify cases so you have more homogenous groups. Then randomly or systematically, right, every kth element. So there's two types that they mention. The one is proportionate. And so you would make sure that you're randomly selecting proportionate to the larger population. They also talk about disproportionate, which is where you might say like, ooh, if I only select, let's say 1% of them identify as Native American. Well, if I don't have a huge sample, let's say I only have 100 people, 1% is one person. And so maybe I want to pick more to have a better idea of what's going on in the population. So maybe even though people who identify as Native American only make up 1% of my population, I might have rep them represent 10% of my sample, just to make sure that I've got enough people to kind of randomly select from to make sure that we can increase that generalizability. Finally, it talks about multi-stage cluster sampling, which is when we don't have a super easily accessible sampling frame list, but we can use subpopulation lists. So the book uses the example of it would be hard to survey all Christians in America, but different church branches often keep master lists of their church members. And so you could look at those lists. Now, the challenge is they still may not be representative of the larger church going population, right? Because every branch has slightly different norms or different beliefs. So it can still have some bias but at least we'll be able to grab some sort of sampling frame and do some sort of random sampling with it. The book also gives the example of sampling city blocks, creating household lists, and then randomly selecting participants from each city block, or again, using stratification or systematic sampling can help. So that is sampling, non-probability and probability sampling, different types depending on our research study and what is available to us. Now, one good technique, if we can't access everyone or interview everyone, we can do survey research. So we'll talk about that next. And here are my references.